OK. Um, thanks for coming again. Uh, are there any questions that you would like me to address before I keep going regarding the material yesterday or <coughs> anything related? Yes? Question, but, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be covered. I'll, I'll be repeating the questions. That was my agreement with the with their conditioner guy, <laughs> that I'm repeating the questions. <laughs> at the exp yeah. So uh, well, we saw that uh, we had this uh, non-homomorphic dependence in uh, the extremal correlator on tau and tau bar. Uh, does this come from uh, the derivative part or a non derivative Yeah, the question is uh, about the coupling constant dependence in the extremal correlation functions that we haven't yet discussed. I just mentioned that as an aside. Uh, so that, that the, the question is whether that's perturbative or non-perturbative. And the answer is that it's both. There are both perturbative and non-perturbative contributions, as they are typical for like any uh, observable in quantum field theory, that there are both kinds of contributions. Any other clarifications before I proceed? OK, very good. So yesterday, I'm just going to start by summarizing the discussion yesterday. So we discussed, uh, uh, we discussed uh, extremal correlators in n equals 4 as a historical motivation. And then we switched, we switched uh, gears to n equals 2 supersymmetric field theories, uh, in particular superconformal field theories. And we, dis we started the discussion by uh, talking about the two famous uh, half BPS sectors of those theories. So there are the one uh, half BPS sector is the Coulomb branch uh, sector of operators, which are annihilated by all the Q bars. And they conjecturally have a zero spin, even though, as I said, uh, the fact that JR vanishes is not proven. And they're vanishing as U2R uh, spin. And their U1R charge is related to the scaling dimension. So this is the U1R uh, charge. And then uh, there is the, Hi the Higgs branch operators. Which are, which are annihilated by a different uh, set of uh, half of the Qs. And for them, the U1R charge vanishes as well as the spin. And their dimension is fixed in terms of the SU2 spin, uh, the SU2R symmetry spin, isospin. So this is the SU2 isospin, SU2R isospin. So as I, as I said, it turns out that this, uh, at least in Lagrangian theories, this uh, sector of operators is uh, classical. So it does not depend on the coupling constants. We also I men also mentioned that uh, it's typical for n equals two superconformal filters to have exactly marginal parameters, which we'll discuss in much more detail today, which are comprised of the Young-Mills couplings and the various theta angles. And it turns out that the, the observables in this sector do depend on those parameters, but those do not. So these are like classical, and uh, therefore in Lagrangian theories they are not interesting. Well, this. Uh, the observables in this sector do depend in a non-trivial fashion on the coupling constants, and that's what makes them interesting. In particular, the cyber witten solution pertains with the Coulomb branch vacua, which are closely related to the Coulomb branch operators, while the Higgs branch is not corrected. And that's more generally true for. So we will focus uh, on those guys because of the interesting dependence on coupling constant that they furnish. OK, so, I, so the outline of uh, today's uh, lecture is that I'll define extremal correlators uh, for Coulomb branch operators. I'll give you a quick uh, proof that uh, they uh, satisfy similar properties that to those that we've seen for n equals 4 supersymmetric, maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. And then we'll, dis we'll describe some special cases of these extremal correlators that are particularly interesting. And they measure distances in field space. So we'll, describe, we'll, discuss, we'll discuss a little bit conformal manifolds and anomalies on conformal manifolds. And then uh, we'll make contact with extremal correlators. So that's uh, the plan roughly for today. And uh, I'll continue that same uh, line of uh, development tomorrow. And then we'll talk about the applications for, or analogies with QCD that uh, this power series is, uh, allow us to make. OK, so what are so I, I want to define now uh, extremal correlators. So this is a definition. So an extremal correlator is a, uh, defined analogously to what we had in n equals 4. 
So now we'll take a bunch of Coulomb branch operators. We'll just put them in so at some points, uh, let's say, so we'll take some Coulomb branch operator O1, put it at some point X1, and then we'll have N of those. Okay, we have N, uh, N Coulomb branch operators, all of which are chiral. And at the end, you remember the idea is to put another operator that soaks up the whole dimension. But clearly, these guys carry an R symmetry charge. According to this formula, delta equals R over 2. So we need to put an anti-chiral <coughs> anti operator to soak up all the lines that come out of the chiral operators. So this is the analogous construction for n equals 2. So we put an anti-chiral operator O dagger at y in such a way that the sum over the dimensions from i to n is uh, the dimension of uh, this guy, which we may call a just O. OK? So this is what extremal correlators. These are extremal correlators in n equals 2. And they're a straightforward generalization of uh, those that we studied in n equals 4. Each of those operators is a half BPS, but they're not a half BPS with respect to the same subalgebra. Those are annihilated by the Q bars. Well, this is annihilated by Q. So those, those, I, we would like. I would like to prove a few, a few. I would like to show a few properties of those correlation functions, and most notably, uh, I want to establish the property that we found for n equals four. I want to show that there is some uh, function of the coupling and the theta angles. And perhaps it's a function of n. You know, it's like SUN gauge theory or something. So it's a function of various uh, exactly marginal parameters and n. But then the dependence on the coordinates is uh, like we had in n equals 4. So it's just that. So that's what I want to prove, that the dependence on the coordinates is straight, is easy. Uh, and it cannot be renormalized. So th that's an exact result. And, they, and, and the main subject is, of course, the computation of this prefactor, which depends in a perturbative as well as non-perturbative fashion on the coupling constants. So this is the first thing that I want to show today, that this dependence on the coordinates is correct, making an analogy with n equals 4. Okay. So let me show you the proof. The proof uh, looks a little bit tricky. Uh, but if you think about it, it's a uh, it's uh, correct. So how do we prove that this is true? Um, so we are going to use the fact that Q bar annihilates O. That's a one. Th we will use this fact. And of course, Q annihilates a O dagger. Since O and O are chiral and, o and O dagger are chiral and antichiral, respectively. And then another fact that we will use is that in supersymmetry, the derivative is the anti-commutator of Q and Q dagger. Of Q and Q bar up to some prefactors. So these are the two properties that we will use. Uh, and that, that's not all. Another thing that I'm going to use, this is where the trick comes in. So this is the somewhat nasty trick that allows this proof to be much simpler than what it could have been. So the trick is what I already alluded to yesterday. We will use the conformal invariance to put the, the last anti-chiral operator, this operator, at infinity. So that's the essence of the, that's the trick. So we'll put O dagger at infinity uh, according to the formula that we used yesterday. OK? So sorry, this is uh, uh, this when y goes to infinity. So this will be an important uh, little trick uh, that will simplify the proof uh, quite a bit. So how do we proceed? So now we have to study O at x1, O1, or then On at xn. And then we have O dagger at infinity. And now what we want to prove, as I already explained, is that it's independent of the coordinates. So this is equivalent to saying that when one, the point y is at infinity, then this is entirely independent of the coordinates. So it's some function of the couplings, but it's independent of the coordinates. 
So that's what we want to prove. And this is a little bit easier than proving this for a generic Y, although, of course, they are the same statement uh, by conformal invariance. So, so we take a derivative with respect to x1 of this correlation function. So we want to prove that it's independent of x1, and the same argument would be true for any of the xn, xi's, so that would be fine. So we use the fact that this is proportional to q, q dagger. And then we use the fact that q dagger annihilates uh, the operator at O1. So therefore, what we find is that the derivative of this correlation function, uh, OK, let me just write it down explicitly. So the derivative of this correlation function uh, with respect to x1 is given by a q dagger of, a, of q. Sorry, this is an anti-commutator. Q dagger of q with O1. And then you have O2, On, and O dagger at infinity. OK? So, so far, so good? Or is it clear? OK, very good. So this is what we got. And now the idea is, of course, uh, to observe that q bar annihilates all of those guys. So q bar should really act only at infinity. So we, see another, so we make another step. We see that the derivative with respect to x1 is the same as a q at O1. Then you have O2, On, and then you have Q bar acting on O dagger at infinity. Okay? And now how do we proceed? Here comes the little nasty trick. So this is a new operator that sits at infinity. We just take the operator that was defined at infinity and we act on it with Q dagger, so we generate some. Uh, descendant, superconformal descendant of that operator. So this is now some Q of O1, O2, On. So this is some fermion operator. So this is like some fermion bar associated to the operator O uh, sitting, at sitting at infinity. Is that okay? Now, the point is that, uh, so now these operators can be all OP'd. Now the OP is non-trivial because there is this uh, fermion here. But they can be OP'd in some way until, they, uh, until you get something on the right-hand side of the operator product expansion of these guys that has a non-trivial overlap with the fermion. But what is the dimension of this fermion? The dimension of this fermion is no longer a delta. So here the dimension of this guy was delta O. But the dimension of this fermion now is delta O plus a half. OK? However, the, fact, the, pro the power of y that multiplies it is still the same as it was before. So this wasn't corrected. Which, in order to have well-defined correlation functions with a fermion that sits at infinity, we need to correct the power of y by adding another plus 1 here. But we haven't done that. And therefore, all the correlation functions are going to decay to, uh, to 0. So this is just identically 0, because we have not multiplied it with a proper factor of y. So all the correlation functions are going to decay like 1 over y. So that's a quick argument. So it doesn't matter what's in the OPE here, as long as we are realize that the power of y that we've multiplied the operator here is not sufficient to make the correlation function non-zero. Non so it just vanishes because it decays, uh, it decays too fast. Let me just do it a little bit more. Maybe it was too quick. It's a tricky argument. It seems too quick. I'll just do another step maybe to, to, to explain how it works. So this is a, a statement about any conformal field theory. So suppose you have a bunch of operators. It doesn't matter, which, it, it doesn't matter whether they are descendants or, or a primaries. It doesn't matter. And then you have some operator that is at some y. And suppose this y is very, very far away from the x's. So the x's are here. So suppose you have, we have one point that's extremely f 
extremely far from all the other points. So from general principles, essentially from locality, we know that this has to decay like 1 over y to the power 2 delta O. That's a general statement. OK? That's because we OP these guys, and we must get something which has dimension uh, delta so that it has a non-zero overlap with this guy. So it must decay faster than this. It, can, it must decay at least as fast as that. Because any, other op any operator that has an overlap with this primary uh, must, must, dec must decay at least as fast as that. So therefore, if we, now, uh, have, if we now multiply this by some power y whose power is not sufficiently large, then we'll just get 0 in the y going to infinity limit. So that's uh, why this vanishes. Because the power of y with which it was multiplied was not sufficiently large. So this proves this assertion. That the x, x y dependence of these correlation functions is restricted to, to, be, to be just it. And therefore, the interesting observable is, a, is the prefactor, not the x y dependence. So it's a tricky argument. It seems too quick, but uh, it's, it's actually correct. Anyway. Are there any questions about it? Good. So now, so now we'll try to keep. Uh, we'll keep going and try to uh, unravel some interesting special cases. So to try to understand these extremal correlators in a general n equals two theories, uh, it's a, it's useful to try to look at some special cases first. And one particular special case that would be very interesting is uh, the two-point function, which is a special case of this n-point function. Of some chiral primary of some Coulomb branch operator and some anti well anti chiral Coulomb branch anti chiral operator located at x and y, such that the dimension of uh, the operator i is the same as the dimension of the operator j, and it's two. As we have described yesterday, those correspond to exactly marginal deformations of the theory. So with such operators can be used. Uh, to uh, to deform the theory by some coupling constants lambda i, and therefore this uh, two-point function has an interesting interpretation that we're going to that we're going to discuss now. So this is a special extreme a special case of an extremal correlator, which has an in which the prefactor has a physical meaning that is more clear. So here the prefactor uh, is a little bit more is a little bit too abstract to parse. But in this special case, where these operators have dimension 2, and they can be used to deform the Lagrangian, and you get exactly marginal operators in this way, uh, this coefficient function is known as the Zama logic of metric. So this is some function of the couplings. And it multiplies, of course, 1 over x minus y to the power 4, which is a special case of that formula. And this function now has a physical meaning and some interpretation that I'm going to explain. This is called the Zama logic of metric. So the Zama logic of metric in theory space, in theory space. So the Zama logic of metric in theory space is an interesting observable in many uh, conformal field theories, and in particular in this n equals 2 superconformal field theories. So this will be the first extremal correlators that we will learn how to compute exactly using localization. And the more general case will follow by some procedure that I'll explain tomorrow. So today we'll focus about understanding what is the logic of metric and what it's good for and how to compute it. Are there any questions? OK, so now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to forget about supersymmetry. For a sec, for, for a few, we'll forget about supersymmetry for uh, the next couple of minutes. 
and we'll try. Uh, I'll, it will be like a general discussion of what are conformal manifolds, what are these exactly marginal parameters, and what is the zamological metric. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. So the idea is the following. Suppose we have a conformal field theory. A conformal field theory in D dimensions. So we're not even going to specify the dimension to be necessarily four. So we have a conform an abstract non supersymmetric conformal field theory in D dimensions. And suppose it has an operator. It has an operator, uh, well, it has operators OI, uh, whose dimension is uh, D. Here, one does not need to get confused because here the dimensions were not D. They were uh, D over 2 or D minus 2. But that's OK because the operator, we need to integrate it over D for theta. So the, the marginal deformation is not given by the Coulomb branch operator, but rather by a descendant of the Coulomb branch operator, such that the, the, the dimension of the actual deformation is actually d, not d minus 2. So the general story is that we have marginal operators of dimension uh, d. So now it's a tempting idea to try to deform the action. We can try to deform the action by uh, adding a sum with some uh, coupling constants. So these are space-time independent. I, I could have put them in outside of the integral, which I'll let me do that. So we have O i x d dx. And I'm going to assume that these operators are real Hermitian. So these are real operators, or Hermitian, <laughs> so that I, I don't have to worry about adding complex conjugates, which I, I can do. with. So we, it's tempting to try to consider this kind of deformation of a conformal field theory. And an interesting question, which is an interesting natural question, is does the theory remain conformal? So does the theory remain conformal? Okay, that's the natural question to ask in this context. So what are some examples of this uh, phenomenon? This is a very common, I mean this kind of thing is very common in statistical physics or uh, even in uh, simple examples of QFT. So an example that you could keep in mind if you like and is free field theory in D dimensions let's say in four dimensions, free field theory in four dimensions, that's a good conformal field theory, and it has a marginal operator. Who knows which marginal operator does the free field theory admit? Good. So an interesting deformation is to add lambda phi to the four. Sorry, d four x. So does anybody know if this remains a conformal field theory or not? Is this a conformal field theory? No, right. Indeed, the beta function of uh, lambda is non-zero. So in the case of uh, the free scalar field, we have a conformal field theory which is free, but there is the operator, the operator phi to the four turns out to be marginally E relevant, right? So if we add this coupling lambda, it flows back to zero. So this is like the lambda coupling. So you don't generate new conformal field theories if you try to go if you try to deform the theory. You just go back to to the original conformal field theory by uh, doing the RG scaling. So you don't get any new conformal field theories. But it could be that there are examples where you do get new conformal field theories in this in this way. Does anybody know of an interesting example without supersymmetry, where the beta functions cancel? Well, does anybody know of an example with supersymmetry? Yes, n equals 4 is a, a, a good example. So with supersymmetry, uh, one famous example is maximally supersymmetric uh, super young mills theory with gauge group SUN. So this theory has a young mills coupling as well as a theta angle. And these are two exactly marginal perturbations. So they do not have any beta function. Does anybody know of another example with supersymmetry 
perhaps? Yeah, with an exactly marginal perturbation. You want a conformal field theory. Very good. That's a exa that example we'll study very much. So this is an n equals 2 example. We have SUN gauge theory with 2NF, hy NF, uh, hyper multiplets. So this example. Oh, sorry, 2N. 2N hypers. So this example we'll study in great detail. In fact, this will be our the canonical example to run these questions on. Uh, this, this example was constructed in the 90s and analyzed in great detail. Uh, does anybody know of examples with n equals 1 supersymmetry where there are exactly marginal perturbations? Very good. The, n the most well-known example with n equals 1 supersymmetry, perhaps, is the beta-deformed super beta-deformed uh, maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory. So there is a certain deformation of that theory that preserves only n equals 1. Uh, and it's exactly marginal. And in fact, this list is, uh, is uh, extremely long. But without supersymmetry, this phenomenon is not very common. However, it's a, it, it does appear in some, there are, there are several examples where it does appear, even without supersymmetry. Does anybody know of an example without supersymmetry? No, in Wesley Mino Witten model, the parameter k is uh, quantized. So it's not a real uh, infinitesimal deformation. So, yeah? I'm not sure, but Liouville in 2D, adding Liouville. So uh, adding the Liouville is another interesting, sm so you can, change, you can change the linear dilaton coupling. So you are talking about changing the linear dilaton coupling. That's often, that's like the most confusing example because it's an infinitesimal deformation, but it actually changes the central charge. So it's not a good example. It changes the energy momentum tensor. So it's not within these rules actually. It, it involves some coupling to curved space, which it's not exactly the same thing. So the Liouville deformation is not a good example. So I'll give you one example, which is very famous. This is called the Ashkin-Teller Ashkin, Ashkin model. Uh, we call it just the C equals 1 model. It's uh, an example in D equals 2. Uh, Ashkin Teller is how the condensed matter people call it. So it's an example in D equals 2 where we have a compact boson of, of radius r. Compact boson of radius r. And it turns out that the radius of this boson is an exactly marginal parameter. Equivalently, you can think about uh, quartic fermion interactions which is called the Turing model. So there is a quartic fermion interaction which is exactly marginal in one plus one dimension, in dimensions. So these things appear in condensed matter physics, uh, especially in two dimensions. And with supersymmetry, it's uh, very common also in higher dimensions. Although the construction of these kind of things without supersymmetry in higher dimensions seems to be very hard. Yeah. Okay. So the question is if I know of any attempts to prove that there aren't conformal manifolds in higher dimensions. So I recommend you to read uh, some recent work by uh, uh, Bashmakov et al. Uh, et al. This is one thing. And then there is also a recent work by Behan et al. This is Connor Behan et al. So they will, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more or less what they're trying to do in a second. So these are some attempts to say something about that question. So the question of whether these parameters are exactly marginal or not, uh, you can answer this question sort of in some, co in some perturbation theory. You can try to add them with an infinite, you can try to add them with a very small coefficient and then compute the beta function. And uh, I won't try to teach you how to do conformal perturbation theory, but what you find uh, is that uh, 
the beta function for this coupling is lambda i, uh, which we can just call beta i. Uh, take the following form. So the beta function, the coefficient of lambda i. So the coefficient of uh, lambda, sorry, this index should be up. Yeah. So the coefficient of lambda i is 0. Does anybody know why? Why is the coefficient of the linear term 0 in the beta function? It's because the dimension was chosen to be d, right? And then there is a quadratic piece with some tensor. And then there is a cubic piece with some tensor. And there is like an infinite series like that. So for these uh, perturbations to be really exactly marginal, meaning that they would define an actual space of conformal field theories, which is often called the conformal manifold. So this is called the conformal manifold. This is the space of conformal field theories. It's not, many, maybe the word manifold is misleading because this space could be slightly singular. Yeah. Are you missing an index? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, let's say A, B, A, B, and then uh, C, D, well, A, B, C, then A, B, C, and so on. So the space of conformal filters is often called a conformal manifold. It could be just a point, but it could be a more interesting space. In all of those examples that we listed above, this space is very interesting, both topologically and geometrically. And also even in the Ashkin-Teller model, this space is interesting. It's the upper half plane divided by some discrete group. But it could be empty, like in many of the non-supersymmetric constructions. Or it could be just one point. So in any case, for the for this m to really exist beyond just the one point that we started from, uh, all of those coefficients have to vanish. So c a b i has to vanish, c a b c i has to vanish. So there are infinitely many conditions on the underlying conformal field theory at the origin, in some sense, that would be required if you wanted to extend the conformal field theory to a whole continuous space. So you can try to compute these constraints order by order. And they were computed in the literature. And you can find them reviewed in these papers. And then you can try to prove that maybe supersymmetry is necessary for all those constraints to be magically satisfied. For, for example, this constraint has an interesting interpretation. This one is really easy. This constraint means that if you take the operator product expansion of two of those marginal operators, the coefficient of another marginal operator vanishes exactly. So the OP of two marginal operators cannot spit out another marginal operator. If they do, you get a beta function that's non-zero. So this is an easy constraint. This is just a constraint on the OP of the original conformal field theory. But this one is already, is already harder. This implies some integral of the four-point functions uh, has to vanish with some kernel and so on. So the constraints become more and more cumbersome. And it's unclear how they could all be satisfied without some magic. So this magic could be supersymmetry. And in two dimensions, there are also ways without supersymmetry, as I've uh, remarked here. So now we'll suppose that this space does exist. We'll suppose that this space of theories does exist, yeah? So let's suppose that M conformal exists. So we have this picture. And the coordinates on this space are the coupling constants, right? So the natural coordinates on this space 
that parameterize the space of conformal filter is our this lambda i's. So this is this is the coordinates are naturally the, the coupling constants. So and you can ask, okay, so is it a Riemannian space? Is like is there a natural metric on this space or is it just a manifold? is it just a manifold? So the observation of Zamolochikov, well, I think it's kind of misattributed. He didn't really discuss that question, but he did some related work. So the observation is that you can define a quantity that looks like the metric by, uh, let's say that you are at some lambda. Let's, let's say that you are at some lambda 0. So this is like a point on the conformal manifold. So let's suppose that you are at some point on the conformal manifold. And you want to ask, OK, what is the metric uh, tensor at that point? So the, the, the point, so what you, you, do, you do, you just define the two-point function. Uh, let's say you put this at 0. This one is at infinity, just so that we don't have to deal with the x minus y dependence. Uh, sorry, and the indices are importantly downstairs. And this defines a certain two-point function. It's a bunch of coefficients. Uh, they don't depend on anything other than uh, lambda. So this correlation function is computed in the conformal field theory at lambda. And this is some function of lambda. So the idea is that this defines a metric tensor on this space. So the two-point functions at each point define the metric tensor. And this is called the Zamolochik of metric interior space. So this gives you some metric on the space of conformal field theories. So in many of these examples, we actually know the metric now. And of course, in this example, in two dimensions, the metric is also known. Uh, so one has to, it's not a trivial statement that this defines a reasonable choice of a Riemannian structure. Because as you remember from differential geometry, the metric at any given point is meaningless, right? You can just take the metric at any, like you can just choose the inertial coordinates. So you can choose the metric at any given point to be just one, delta ij. So similarly here, what is the physical meaning of uh, choosing the metric to be delta ij? Physically, if you have operators given at some point, you can always redefine the two-point functions to be one, right? You just normalize the operators. You, take, you choose an orthonormal basis. So physically, when we have a conformal field theory, we are often uh, compelled to choose an ortho normal basis of operators OI. And then the metric would be just the delta function. But you cannot choose such a basis everywhere. So you can make some basis choice. This basis choice depends on the coupling constants. But you will not be able to set the metric to be 1 everywhere. You can also argue, and that is non-trivial, that there is no obstruction to choosing the first derivatives of the metric to be 0. This is also uh, something that you can always do in differential geometry. In conformal field theory, this is harder to see. This amounts to be able to choose some contact terms in three-point functions. And to show that, you have to use this condition very, very importantly. So this condition comes in in the proof that this uh, can always be done. So you can always choose inertial coordinates. And therefore, so the, really, the, the physical object on the conformal manifold is not the metric. The metric is not physical. The physical object is the curvature tensor, the Riemann, the Riemann curvature tensor, which is invariant under, <coughs> well, which is still coordinate dependent, but you can form various scalars like r, r squared, you know. And this, so this is the physical object that uh, you can compute from the metric. So it's not obvious, but it's true that you can define such a metric. And that will be, so, that will be what we'll try to do for these n equals 2 models, to compute the metric exactly. Christian? Yeah. Uh, is there uh, some physical meaning to the curvature, which uh, evidence that it appear in some uh, direct way in the correlation function? Yeah. So the question is, what is the physical meaning of the curvature? So if you are, 
if I mean, this uh, description is not entirely satisfactory because what I'm telling you is that you have to compute the two-point function at every point and then observe that there is no orthonormal choice everywhere. And then by taking derivatives of the metric, you could extract the Riemann tensor. You could say, OK, I don't want to do that. Can you just give me an observable that spits out the Riemann metric? And it turns out that you can do it. So there is a way to, if you, there are some, well, there is a lot of literature on that, but certain integrals of four-point functions anti-symmetrized in some indices over some funny regions of uh, the cross ratios spit out exactly the Riemann tensor. And they're independent of uh, orthonormal basis choices, independent of reparametrizations. So there are some combinations of four-point functions that spit out directly the Riemann tensor rather than the metric. But there are integrals of four-point functions with some funny, funny regions and, con and commutators. So this is a little bit easier. Sorry, I cannot hear because of the air conditioner. Are you saying that it works in a two-stack Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I, 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 I remember the formula in two dimensions. Actually, the exact formula for the Riemann tensor depends uh, a little bit on dimension because there is some change of variables involved in the space of cross ratios. So in four dimensions, in, in two dimensions, I actually remember the formula. It's just an integral over all the possible cross ratios of the four-point function where you put one operator at uh, zero, one operator at eta, one operator at one, one operator at infinity. And then there is a funny weight, which is a logarithm of eta squared. So you can argue that this integral converges. For this integral to converge, you got to use these conditions just to, to show that it indeed converges. And you can show that this leads to the Riemann tensor. So this, this formula is only true in two dimensions. But there, is a, there are similar formulas in higher dimensions. So it is an observable. It's an integrated four-point function. This is something that's actually very natural from the bootstrap point of view. Uh, this kind of integrated four-point functions in Euclidean signature could be uh, studied with the bootstrap. OK, so now uh, I want to describe a slightly more advanced idea. This uh, idea is more advanced. It doesn't appear in any like textbook or class, something like that. But it's uh, crucial to understand how to compute. So our main goal is to compute this in n equals 2, right? That's uh, the main goalpost of these lectures. So to actually, well, one can explain how to do it in several ways. Uh, there are several derivations in the literature. One derivation that I like is uh, through some anomalies on the conformal manifold, uh, because that derivation has some uh, features which are also true without supersymmetry. And so it may have other applications. And then there are derivations which are a little bit more uh, suited to supersymmetry. So I want to, for a second, go back and introduce these coordinates x and y. So we have the Zama logic of metric, and then we have 1 over x minus y. And since the dimensions of these operators is uh, d, so the power here is 2d. OK? So an interesting idea is to try to write it in momentum space, which seems weird. But just tag along for a second. You, you'll see that it, this is useful. Let's try to go to momentum space. So this idea is actually very useful. And there are many papers about various aspects of conformal filters in momentum space. So let's try to write it, out, write it in momentum space. So we have OIP, OJ minus P. And then we have the Zama logic of metric G. So I need to put some twiddles here, because we do a Fourier transform. So then we have the Zama logic of metric, which is. And then we have the Fourier transform of this thing. Uh, so what is the Fourier transform of this function? Let's do it here. So we need to do e to the i p x 
a 1 over x to the power 2d. So we can, and we need to integrate over a x. So just from dimension analysis, this is p to the power um, d. Right? Is that okay? So, so we write p to the power d. But actually, this is not correct. Let's say for the well, there is a mistake here. We have there are actually two cases. So this is almost correct, but it's not entirely correct. If d is even, this is p to the d times log p squared. If this is if d is odd, this is just p to the d. How do you see that there is a, how do you see that you need this log squared? Sorry, how do you see that there is this logarithm? Uh, so the intuitive reason is, let's say, let's take d equals uh, even, let's say, let's take d equals 4. So if I didn't put the log, you would say, okay, the Fourier transform is p to the 4. But p to the 4 is a polynomial in momentum space. This is a polynomial, a regular polynomial. What happens if you do a Fourier transform back to position space of a polynomial? You get derivatives of delta functions. So the Fourier transform back would have been just a box squared of a delta function. That would have been wrong, because what we wanted to do is the Fourier transform of a, of a non-local function, like 1 over x, not something that has only supported coincident points. So for even dimensions, this is a polynomial, so it cannot possibly be the right answer. But for odd dimensions, this is not a polynomial. p cubed is not a polynomial in p squared, so it's fine. You cannot write it as a differential operator acting on a delta function. So you actually need the logarithm in even dimensions. Otherwise, it's wrong. So here, I'm just assuming that d is equal to 2n. So d is even. And then we need the logarithm. So on the one hand, so we see that we need the logarithm. I is there a question about why we need the logarithm? Or it's fine? OK. So people don't like logarithms in conformal filters. The reason is that a conformal filter is not supposed to have any scale. So how can we put a scale? Like, what is this scale here? It seems meaningless, right? Because it's a conformal filter. It's not supposed to have any fundamental scale. So how can there be logarithms? So the point is the following. This is actually very common in conformal filters. In many conformal filters, correlation functions in momentum space would have logarithms. And you might get confused. How can there be logarithms in momentum space? So the point is that suppose you try to see if this logarithm has any uh, important uh, role to play in this story. So suppose you just rescale p by some mu. And you try to see what happens when you rescale the coordinates or the momenta. So how, what would happen to this uh, p to the d log p squared over lambda squared? Well, this will transform to p to the d log of mu squared over lambda squared. But as I have just explained, if this is even, this is a completely local object. So this, is, this has only delta, only log, only, so this is only, this is only supported at coincident points. So this is only supported at coincident points. So conformal invariance is not strictly violated, because conformal invariance is a property of uh, separated point correlation functions, not of coincident point correlation functions. So conformal invariance is not violated. because uh, the conformal word identities are only true at separated points, not at coincident points. OK, so in fact, these logarithms in momentum space in various, conformal, in various correlation functions have many applications. For example, you can also look at a paper by Pimentel 
I hope I, and uh, Maldacena about some similar, some similar story in the context of uh, correlation functions in cosmology, where similar logarithms uh, appear in conformal field theories in the sitter space. So they, uh, they pop out in many applications. So it's good to know. So, so actually, logarithm squared is not allowed. Does any, maybe I'll just ask the audience, why is logarithm squared never allowed? Like, could it be logarithm squared, or that would be really not, not OK? Oh, does anybody see the answer? So logarithm squared would be bad because if I rescale the momentum, I wouldn't get it would not be a pure contact term. It would not be a pure polynomial. So this can never appear in conformal field theories. But this is fine. So when you see such a phenomenon that the conformal invariance is preserved at separated points, but it's violated at coincident points, that's the, si that's the smoking gun signature for a conformal anomaly. So a, a similar anomaly is the central charge anomaly in two dimensions, which, are, which is very well known, the Virasora anomaly. It's exactly the same story, that there is some logarithm in momentum space. So, well. <coughs> I should have said the central charge in four dimensions. This is an exactly the same story, but in two dimensions it's a little bit different. So this is a conformal anomaly, and there is a mathem the mathematical way to treat it. So the mathematical uh, way to handle such an anomaly, the mathematical way to handle this is to take the coupling constants and promote them as to functions of space, of space, time, OK? This is the common trick that allows you to understand these anomalies a little bit more systematically. Because then you can ask, what happens to the, whole part what happens to the partition function? So ne let's define the partition function to be uh, an integral over all the fields. And then there is an exponential of the action of our conformal field theories. And then we add coupling constants lambda i, which are functions of x, and they multiply these operators. So now we've promoted the coupling constants to functions. It's a, it's a useful trick, because now the partition function is a functional of some functions. So it has, a it has more information than just the partition function as a function of some fixed couplings. And now it's a sensible question to ask. Suppose these are exactly marginal operators. So these are exactly marginal, meaning that the beta functions vanish and you have a conformal manifold. It's a sensible question to ask what happens to this partition function if we change the scale. So as we've learned from this little exercise, when we change the scale, you might get some contact terms. So a mathematical machinery that allows you to encompass these contact terms in some useful formula is uh, to think about the partition function as a function of the couplings, and then perform a conformal transformation on this whole partition function and see what you get. So let's perform a, so a conformal trans so let's perform a, a conformal transformation labeled by some uh, function sigma of the logarithm of the partition function. So this is the axiom of this is an axiom of quantum field theory or of a con or let's say of conformal field theories that if you try to do a rescaling of the partition function in a conformal field theory you'll only get a function of this, of this, of this uh, classical object lambda. So there won't be any quantum operators. Because the theory is genuinely conformal, so the violation of conformal invariance can be only due to background fields, not due to the like, uh, physical uh, observables. So, this is some, so the idea is that this is an integral over ddx uh, of some uh, local action that is made out of these functions lambda ix. So that's the general expression for a conformal anomaly in any conformal field theory. You could also introduce a metric, which I'll do. So you can also couple the theory to some background metric. So it's not a dynamical metric, it's just a background metric. And then uh, the partition function is a function of lambda and g. And you perform a conformal transformation of, the cap of, the, of, of uh, all the coordinates. Or equivalently, you while rescale the metric. So this is just, I mean, I'm trying to, so to say some general things about how anomalies work very, very quickly. Uh, 
the details might not be clear if you've never seen anomalies before, but uh, at least you can follow the rough logic. So, so the point is that using these logarithms, you can. The point is that using these logarithms, you can determine the anomaly. And now I'm just going to tell you the anomaly in a, in four dimensions. It has a different expression in any even dimension. But I'll just write down the answer in four dimensions, and then you'll see what we can do with that. So in four dimensions, this is a this is a hard computation. But uh, I'll just write the answer for this computation. It's proven in the literature. So the anomaly uh, in four dimensions uh, takes the following form. I'm just going to write it and then step out so that you could see. Sorry. So the zamalogic of metric appears explicitly in the anomaly since it appeared here. And this is the coefficient of the log. So the zamalogic of metric appears here. And there are some uh, operators here and many other terms. And this uh, box head is the ordinary box plus some Christoffel symbols. <coughs> so when it acts on lambda, uh, well, there is some expression that is not going to shed light on anything, but I'll just write it in any case. So there is some kind of a modified box operator, and there is a, a, mess, of a mess of terms here. So this operator, the, the oper the what you find is, c is called in the literature sometimes Panate's uh, fratkin seitlin operator. Something is wrong with the spell spelling. OK, so the, the details here are not important. What I wanted to say is that just from these logarithms, you can determine a certain anomaly polynomial. And supersymmetry comes at this point. So all this is true without supersymmetry, and there are many applications for this thing. But supersymmetry comes at this point because you should also require that this anomaly polynomial is appropriately supersymmetrized. So this is like saying physically that these logarithms cannot just be isolated logarithms. They have to obey the word identities of supersymmetry. So this is where, this is where supersymmetry comes in. Up to here, this is very general and does not depend on supersymmetry. So supersymmetry comes at exactly this point. And that's going to be the, like, the ent that's how we're going to enter the subject of extremal correlators. So supersymmetry, in particular, n equals 2 supersymmetry. n equals 2 supersymmetry uh, implies various restrictions on the anomaly polynomial. And most, interest, most interestingly, one finds uh, the following fact. So when you try to supersymmetrize this anomaly polynomial, this is a kind of a complicated exercise. And it's not very illuminating. But there is one thing that uh, I do want to tell you, which is that if you supersymmetrize this anomaly polynomial, there is one term that pops out, which is particularly interesting. And this term is a half a integral of d4x, then some function k of lambda lambda bar. These are the exactly marginal couplings times box of uh, delta sigma, box squared of delta sigma. This term is a particularly in interesting term that pops out from supersymmetrizing the anomaly polynomial. And now I have to tell you what is k. Uh, delta sigma, it's the scale variation. So you know what is delta sigma. Uh, I'll just tell you what is k. So in, it turns out that in this n equals 2 supersymmetric theories, the zamalogic of metric so the first thing about this n equals 2 supersymmetric theories is that the exactly marginal couplings, which are in general some real couplings by which you can deform the action, it's natural to think about them as uh, complex parameters which come in, 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 com in, in pairs of, comp of uh, 
some complex parameter and it's complex conjugate. And the intuition here is that these are like the young mills coupling and the theta angle, and this is the complex conjugate. So if you have cyber theory in mind, this could be 1 over g young mills squared uh, plus, let's say, i over theta, uh, then some 2 pi. And this is the complex conjugate in some convention. And this would be the complex conjugate, so with the minus sign. So the first thing you need to know about n equals 2 supersymmetry is that uh, since the marginal deformations appear in front of chiral ring operators, you remember this expression which we wrote already many times. So the, the, comp the exactly marginal deformations of n equals 2 supersymmetric conformal filters uh, come, in complex, uh, come in complex parameters because we need to multiply chiral ring operators, which are complex operators. So that's the first thing. So it's a natural complex manifold. So M conformal in the context of supersymmetry is a, is a complex even dimensional space. So it's, even, it's always even dimensional because these are coming complex pairs. The other thing that you need to know is that the Zama logic of metric has only mixed components. So the metric components, which are i, i, and j, or i bar, i bar, vanish identically. So the metric is only like uh, between lambda and lambda bar, like in a complex, like on the complex plane, dz, dz bar. And it turns out that it can be written as a second derivative of a scalar function. This is called the Keller structure. So in con when the theory has n equals 2 supersymmetry, the conformal manifold is not just a generic Riemannian manifold. It's actually a Keller manifold, a Keller space. So in particular, it's a complex space, an even dimensional space with a Keller function. So exactly this Keller function appears in the anomaly polynomial, amazingly. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah. Can you just speak a little bit louder yeah. since I... The question is if this anomaly polynomial can be obtained by anomaly inflow, right? Yeah. Right. So <coughs> anomaly inflow, the ano ideas of anomaly inflow have been very successful with chiral anomalies. But uh, conformal anomalies uh, have never worked out. Like nobody has ever been able to obtain the conformal anomalies from anomaly inflow in any useful way. So it's not known. I see. Sorry? Yeah, I understand. Um, OK, so we can go over that. OK, good question. So the question is, what are the geometric structures of conformal manifolds? Let me summarize it here. I've been a little bit fast with that point. So let me just do a more pedagogical summary. So without supersymmetry, this is the generic case. What do we know about the conformal manifold? It's just a Riemannian space. So M conformal has a Riemannian structure. So we don't, we are not aware of any additional structure on this space uh, without supersymmetry. It just seems like a generic Riemannian manifold, and it could be odd dimensional in principle. Then uh, you can try to you can try to label the properties of this conformal manifold. Like, you know, for any given number of dimensions with any given number of supersymmetries. So I won't try to do it like extremely systematically. I'll just give you a few examples. So d equals 4 and d equals 3. Without supersymmetry, there is always like nothing more to say. It's just a Riemannian space. But if you have n equals 4 supersymmetry, uh, the conformal manifold, as far as I know, is just scalar. Well, it's a. So n equals 4 theory is essentially unique. It's maximally supersymmetric young mills theory. So it's a Keller manifold, but we also know the metric, and it turns out that it's a constant curvature space. So it's a, it's a constant curvature. And uh, in fact, it's just a, well, it's just the, high, it's a, the upper half plane mod the uh, SL to Z. So it's essentially just H mod SL to Z if the gauge group is SUN. 
this is the upper half plane. So when n equals 4, we know everything. For n equals 2, as far as we know, it's just a Keller manifold. There might be additional restrictions in the future. Maybe, maybe somebody in the future could prove that like, the curvature is non-positive. Or maybe somebody in the future could prove that it's a quotient of something. It's, at the moment, we don't know of anything beyond just Keller. And in fact, for n equals 1, it's the same. So there is no more structure that's known on the conformal manifold besides just being a Keller space. Now in three dimensions, with n equals 1 supersymmetry, well, uh, presumably here it's just a Riemannian space. Uh, with n equals 2 supersymmetry, you get Keller. And with n equals 4 supersymmetry, uh, you cannot have a conformal manifold. That's uh, the situation in three dimensions. So with n equals 4 and up, you cannot have any you cannot have conformal manifolds in three dimensions. So. Because there is no marginal. Hmm? Because there is no you can prove that there are no marginal deformations. Exactly marginal deformations, yeah. Yeah, so if there are many interesting questions about these spaces. You can ask, are they uh, compact? So as you see here, it's non-compact. In this example, it's non-compact. But it's a funny non-compact space. It's like uh, the fundamental domain. So it has finite volume, but it has like some uh, directions which are infinite distance away. The cusp at infinity is at distance, dis infinite distance away, but the volume of this space is nevertheless finite, even though it's like a, a thin throat. It's like a very, very thin throat that goes to infinity. So the volume doesn't blow up, but the distance goes to infinity. So a natural conjecture is maybe the volume of the spaces is always finite. Another natural conjecture is that maybe all the, all the non-compact directions on these conformal manifolds look like thin throats. That's also a very natural conjecture, consistent with what we know. So there are many questions about these things, and uh, well, not, not all the questions are uh, answered. So the metric can be computed as far as we know, in this case, exactly. This case is known. This is trivial. This will be a special case. But uh, what I'm talking about here now is the computation of the metric in this case. For this case, there is no, no progress. And also for this case, there is no substantial progress yet. Yeah? Uh, the connection which naturally appears in the other end? Oh, that's a great question. So actually, this is something that was, at the time we struggled with. So a priori, this connection could have been anything in the anomaly polynomial. But there is something that's called the Wesomino consistency condition. You know what it is? But there is something that's called the Wesomino consistency condition that turns out to imply that this connection has to be Levi Civita. Yeah. So the question is whether the fact that there are conformal anomalies means that the conformal symmetry is broken, right? So there are two types of anomalies in physics that are often confused. When you learn like quantum field theory, they are often confused. One is called the uh, ABJ anomaly, after some people. And then one is called the, the Tooft anomaly. The, these are completely different things. The ABG anomaly means that the symmetry is actually broken. An example is the electrodynamics in which there is a U1 axial symmetry that is broken by instantons. So this is an ABG anomaly. So this looks like uh, a background gauge field, not a dynamical gauge field, then a triangle, and then two dynamical gauge fields. Dynamical. Dynamical. So this type of anomaly is called ABJ. I think it's Bardin, Jakiv, and Adler, right? Yeah, so this is called ABJ. That means that the symmetry is just gone. So that's not an anomaly. That's just explicit violation. So nowadays, I just think about it as explicit violation of the symmetry. It's, like as, it's as bad as just adding like a mass. 
that would break the U. So you could add a mass to the electron. In massless electrodynamics, you could just add a mass to the electron. That would also break U1 axial. These two things are as bad. Uh, there are many examples of duality in which on one side the symmetry is broken by anomaly and on the other side it's broken by a mass. So there is no fundamental distinction between an ABG anomaly and just explicit violation of the symmetry. A Tooft anomaly is something much more subtle and much more useful. This is not useful. This just means that the symmetry is gone. A Tooft anomaly arise, Tooft anomalies arise when all the external legs are background, not dynamical. And then the symmetry is not broken. Rather, this is the anomalies that you have to match. So these anomalies need to match in RG flows. But the symmetries are unbroken. So the symmetries act on the Hilbert space. The, the ch charges are conserved. Everything is good. But these anomalies need to match, which is a different concept. It's not broken. These ones do not need to match. So there are many examples of dualities where these anomalies don't match. But it's fine. They don't need to match because they correspond to symmetries that don't exist. Here, the symmetries exist, and these anomalies need to match. So the conformal anomalies that I've described here are of this type. And that's when it's useful to write an anomaly polynomial, when the anomaly is of the Tooth type. In this case, there is no. Another case that uh, is left out is what, what happens if you have background, background, dynamical. This actually did not appear in the classical literature. So you can ask, is it a tooth like or is it a ABJ like? So this is more, much more interesting. What does that mean? But uh, it's more, more subtle. But, uh, but I'm talking about this one, which is a more conventional anomaly. OK, a any other questions? OK, so I want to get back to this. This is the supersymmetrization of the anomaly polynomial. So the next idea here, and that's what I'm going to uh, finish the lecture with. Then I'll just like have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, that's the last thing I want to say. I want to show you that this leads to some uh, fantastic uh, connection with localization, which is something that we haven't uh, discussed yet. By the way, this is not true in n equals 1. The reason that for n equals 1 supersymmetric theories in four dimensions, there isn't as much progress yet is because this term does not appear in n equals 1. When you supersymmetrize the anomaly polynomial with n equals 1, this does not appear. And this is like this is the key, the key player in this game, turns out. So suppose you wanted suppose uh, you wanted to try to understand the connection between R4 and S4. It's well known that they are connected by a stereographic projection, namely a conformal rescaling. So it's not so there is a stereographic a stereographic map here. There is the well known stereographic map, which means that uh, R4 and S4 are just connected by conformal transformation. So it preserves all the angles. So a conformal transformation is this parameter delta sigma. Delta sigma was a small conformal transformation. Well, by some finite delta sigma. So the idea is that uh, we can use this term to learn something about the partition function in S4. Even though we haven't specified the base space yet, we can now use this term to integrate the anomaly by doing successive small conformal transformations until we get to S4. So integrating the anomaly polynomial, the following claim uh, comes out. So integrating the anomaly polynomial, what we find is that the partition function on S4 it's just e to the k. We integrate that, that becomes 1, and then we get e to the k. And there is a factor of 1 over 12 here, if you do it carefully. So that's how, the connect that's how this uh, business of extremal correlators gets connected to localization. <coughs> it turns out that the force sphere partition function uh, is just the exponential of the Keller potential on the space of theories. So miraculously, the force sphere partition function was computed by Peston. But when he wrote the original paper, he did not say what is the meaning of the force sphere partition function. He just computed it. 
and this is the physical meaning of the force sphere partition function. It's the exponential of the Keller potential in, ther in theory space. Okay, so this is the physical interpretation of the force sphere partition function. So therefore, we can write the following useful formula. This is, our, this is the first extremal correlator that we can now uh, determine using uh, the force sphere partition function. So we see that to compute the zoologic of metric for n equals two field theories, superconformal field theories, this is, sorry, so this is uh, GIJ. GIJ is that. Uh, and this is obtained through this reasoning. We can now relate it to the force sphere partition function. So we can write two formulas that are exactly the same. And this is a homework exercise to check that they're exactly the same. So this is a trivial thing, right? When you take the logarithm of z, you immediately pull out k. And then you take two derivatives of k. And by definition, this is g. So this is trivial. Uh, there is another way to write the answer, which is actually more useful for what will come soon. So we, take, we put the partition function squared in the denominator. And then we have a determinant over the following matrix. z is 4, d over d lambda z is 4, d over d lambda bar z is 4, and then uh, the second derivative, d over d lambda, d over d lambda bar of z is 4. These formulas are the same, you can check. So, <laughs> say again, it looks like, but fantastic question. So the comment here is uh, that this, he, the gentleman in the audience does not like this formula because uh, he knows that K is not a well-defined function. So the metric is actually, also the metric is not a uh, great observable. It's also not completely well-defined because you can always choose an inertial frame. But k is much worse, because k can also be shifted by a purely holomorphic function of lambda i plus a purely anti-holomorphic function of lambda i bar. If you shift k in this fashion, it doesn't affect the left-hand side, since the derivatives annihilate those two pieces, right? So you might be worried that this means that the partition, force sphere partition function makes, makes no sense. I mean, this formula cannot be possibly right. Uh, so the first comment is that in, when, we make fine, when we make contact with the zoomological of metric, this ambiguity disappears. But the second comment is that indeed, in Peston's partition function is not universal. He just chose a convention. So this is only, in, no, the, you, you can think about this as a, you can think about fixing f and f bar as a, some sense, in some sense a generalized choice of Keller frame. So you can think about it as a choice of Keller frame. And it's a completely ambiguous process. It turns out that there is a similar ambiguity in the computation of Peston, which is in one to one. So when you compute force sphere partition functions of physical theories, it's always ambiguous. The ambiguity is given by a holomorphic function. And he just made the choice. The ambiguity is that there is a counter term, which looks like a holomorphic function of the couplings times the curvature squared integral over d4x. And it's fully supersymmetric, and it's, it's all good. So whenever you compute the force sphere partition function, you can always add the purely holomorphic function of the couplings of the chiral multiplets times curvature squared appropriately supersymmetrized. Alternatively, when you regularize these determinants, it's, um, there is a small ambiguity, which, is, which corresponds to a subtraction of some divergence. And that ambiguity is given by a holomorphic function. And in the original computation, uh, Peston just made an arbitrary choice without saying it, but he did. And uh, that choice corresponds to a choice of Keller frame. 
So this formula is true. Both sides have the same ambiguity. So it's a covariant formula. So it's a very good question, indeed. In fact, one of the consistency checks that you can run on this formula is to see that there is a corresponding ambiguity on the left-hand side. Otherwise, this formula would make no sense. OK, so we've made a connection between the two-point function. Uh, the si sorry, this, has been, this must have been Dagger. So we've made a connection between the simplest extremal correlator, which is the Zama logic of metric correlator, and the force field partition function. So next time, we'll analyze this in SU2, or maybe even SUN gauge theory. I'll show you some, uh, I mean, I'll show you that this receives perturbative as well as non-perturbative corrections, and we'll see what is the physical meaning of that. And then we'll write more general formula for any extremal correlators and uh, make some con connection with resurgence. Any, any, more, any, more any more questions? Uh, the question if, if I want to say a little bit more about this derivation. Which one? This one? Yes, how would you get this? The idea was to just integrate the anomaly polynomial. So the idea is that if you know the partition function on some space, you know from the anomaly polynomial you can find the partition function on any space that is related by a conformal transformation. Okay, but then we wrote just one term that is inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the full anomaly polynomial is the like uh, you know, four lines or something, and there are many terms. And several of them contribute to this uh, computation. And you just have to do the algebra. And that's what you find at the end of the algebra. I can give references where this is done carefully. But it's not illuminating. It's just you have to write the supersymmetric version of this anomaly polynomial, which is a mess. And then you need to integrate it. But the advantage is that if you know the partition function on any space m, you can obtain the partition function on any space that is conformally equivalent by just integrating the anomaly polynomial. Uh, so yeah, that was done in the literature. And uh, that, that's the result of this computation for S4. Any more questions? Yeah, so. Uh, I believe yes. So for example, uh, people have computed. Pr the question is whether there is a similar uh, formula for other various uh, computations, right? So first of all, literally the same formula, just with a different coefficient, uh, is true for two in two dimensions. So if you are, since you already asked, I'll just mention it. So there is also a two-sphere partition function for two comma two supersymmetric theories in two dimensions. And literally the same formula is true, just with uh, it's like e to the minus k, literally the same. And the derivation is in fact exactly the same. You just and these anomaly polynomials are a little bit simpler because they are in two dimensions. So I, in fact, uh, one way of presenting this subject would have been that I would only discuss two dimensions and then say that four dimensions is similar because all the technicalities in two dimensions are easier. So this is actually this is still this is exactly true, and this is useful to compute the this. Distances between two dimensional conformal filters. The conformal manifold is again a Keller space, and this has been used to check uh, mirror symmetry, compute new Gromov of Witten invariance, and you know. Now, there is an interesting question what about this? Is there a similar formula for this? Here, I don't know the answer, but the speculation that I've never uh, checked was that if the theory is n equals 2, then at least in the limit of small enough S1, this should be the exponential of some uh, line bundle that was discussed by, uh, I believe, uh, Andy Naitsky. So I can explain that a little bit more precisely, but that's a, that's a very speculative. I've never like uh, checked if this makes any sense, but uh, th that could be true. Um, in for S3, for S for th in three dimensions, the three sphere partition function uh, also has an interesting interpretation, where people write it as e to the minus f, and this f is uh, the f coefficient of the underlying conformal field theory, and it turns out to be independent of the exactly marginal parameters. So three dimensions is in one way different, that it turns out that the three sphere partition function is independent of the coupling constant, and it's some it's just some constant. But this constant is interesting. This constant has some interpretation in terms of entanglement entropy. It's called the f coefficient, and it's monotonic energy flows. 
So three dimensions is on one hand easier because there is no coupling constant de dependence, but on the other hand, it's a it makes some contact with entanglement entropy and it's kind of it's nice in some other ways. So yeah, and for the five, I mean, there is also this, obviously you can ask this question about six dimensions and five dimensions, and then I don't know. I have no idea. Right. Right. That's a right. That's a very good question. So people, are, so uh, there, there is a paper about this. Uh, I'll tell you what I know. So the question is the question of Maxim is what is the interpretation of this formula from the point of view of uh, gluing uh, blocks, right? Holomorphic blocks. So there is a paper by. Uh, uh, Bacas et al. about something that's called the Calabi diastasis. Maybe I'm not spelling it right. And so the idea is that uh, he's indeed he's trying to understand what is the interpretation of this formula from the point of view of cutting and gluing. And so his idea is that the hemisphere partition function measures some kind of Keller potential for the boundary degrees of freedom. And there is some, there is some invariant that's called the Calabi diastasis. And well, I, I, I cannot fully reconstruct the argument. But uh, if you want to learn about it, you should just look up Bacchus's paper on Calabi diastasis. I, I won't be able to fully reconstruct the logic of that. Because typically on the usual Keller manifold, Keller potential is the log of log of the section. Right. So Very good, yeah. I think. Yes. Yes. Um, I think it's called the. Mm, mm, you have in mind the canonical bundle? Yes, yeah. Yeah. It might be. I've. Uh, it could be that the hemisphere partition function. So indeed, the exponential of the Keller potential, you can view it as a section of uh, uh, L times L bar, where L is the line bundle th that you mentioned. And it's, it is, of course, a natural conjecture to say that the hemisphere partition function is a section of L, and the other hemisphere partition function is a section of L bar. And I think that's consistent with the. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Any more questions about? Yeah. Say again. Just a little bit louder. Right. So an open question in the field, which is interesting, is how to compute the distances or the Zamolotchikov metric in three dimensions. Unfortunately, the three-sphere partition function spits out a number that's independent of the conformal manifold coordinates. And therefore, it's just some kind of invariant of the whole conformal manifold. But it doesn't depend on where you are on the conformal manifold. It's the f coefficient of the conformal field theory. And nobody knows how to compute the Keller metric in uh, three dimensions with for n equals two theories. So that's unfortunately the situation. Uh, the cases in which we can compute these this, uh, this extremal correlators or Keller metrics are 2 comma 2 in two dimensions and n equals 2 in four dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can all you can all trade you can understand all these things from the properties of the supersymmetrized anomaly polynomial. That's why I presented that point of view. It seems a little bit baroque and uh, complicated, but it's a streamlined. It's a machine that allows you to answer these questions without uh, like new conceptual work. You just need to understand what happens when you supersymmetrize the anomaly polynomials, and it turns out that in three dimensions you don't get anything, and in four dimensions with n equals one you don't get anything. So, but you do get something interesting in four dimensions with n equals two and two dimensions with two comma two. And I think also two dimensions with two comma zero actually, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>